All right, good evening and welcome to this conversation on Faye D'Souza. This is life with Faye. There is, of course, a problem that is brewing in Karnataka that seems to have gotten worse. On our news bulletin today, you'll get the latest updates of everything that has happened as far as the, um, the issue of stopping little girls from going to school. That's the problem, really, that we have in our country right now because of what they're wearing. We're not allowing girls between the ages of 16 and 18 to go to class and get an education. And it just seems like the most ridiculous thing, but as, as of now, these uh, protests have spread across the state of Karnataka. Some of it got violent today. In reaction to that, I must point out, um, the state of Madhya Pradesh has said that from next term, it will completely ban all burkas and hijabs from all schools in Madhya Pradesh as well. The Karnataka chief minister has closed high schools and colleges for the next three days, uh, which can only be seen as a massive defeat uh, uh, from the state on the state government's part of their inability to maintain law and order. In the meantime, the case is being heard by the Karnataka High Court as well. Devdat Kamath is the lawyer who is arguing for these young women, five young women who have approached the Karnataka High Court, arguing that preventing them from wearing the hijab in the classroom is a violation of their rights. So we want to take a look at what the law says, what our constitution says, because remember, our constitution, first of all, gives us the right to equality, which means that we are all equal. And we should all be treated equal. It gives us the right to profess and practice our religion. It gives us the right to education. Um, where does all of this now, as far as these girls are concerned, if these young women are concerned, where does all of this actually settle in? Um, if we look at what's happened in the news today, it is a dark and very sad day for India, where young women going to school were heckled by their classmates, um, where older men on Twitter actually opined on whether or not they should be wearing what they should be wearing and whether or not they should be allowed in education. It really has crumbled around us. We'll also ask the question of whether this has to do with the elections that are happening in various states and why this is happening at all. Joining me to help me understand um, what the constitution says about our individual rights is Mr. Dushim Davi, Senior Advocate with the Supreme Court of India. Mr. Davi, good evening. And yeah. thank you for joining us. I'll also ask Mr. Davi, the, the idea of a democracy fundamentally says that it doesn't matter if there's just one person demanding rights, that one person's rights are also important in the face of the entire majority. And where does that actually fit in when it comes to maintaining law and order? Because the Karnataka government argued that you cannot wear anything that will disturb the peace. So we'll find out what that means as well. Mr. Dave, I want to place before you the arguments of uh, Devdat Tavat before the court today. He first of all said that the court will need to examine firstly whether wearing the headscarf is an essential part of being Muslim or essential part of the Islamic religion. He then also argued his second submission was that the hijab is protected by Article 191A and Article 196, and that asking someone to take off the hijab is in violation of their right to privacy. I want to understand from you, do you believe that these young women's rights are being violated at this point? Let me put a... Uh... Uh, count, counter question to before the country. Hmm. Hundreds of millions of women in our villages, in our villages, always cover their faces with a gungat. Are you going to bring a law tomorrow to say that women should not be put, uh, hiding their uh, faces in front of the elders and in front of the strangers in millions of villages across the country? I mean, it's really what people wear is not something which is justiciable at all. It is people's choice. It's a part of freedom of speech and expression. And I, I think, you know, uh, I would say liberty interest includes uh, grooming and dressing. That exists. You can't just allow uh, it to be, you know, uh, interfered with by the state. So I feel, you know, besides... Uh, uh, I think fundamental rights, what is most crucial today before the country, and that's something which we under, must understand, is that the preamble to the constitution expressly uses the expression fraternity assuring 
the dignity of an individual. Now, if this fraternity, the brotherhood of men and women is to be maintained, individual's dignity is to be respected. Are we going to allow, you know, this kind of debate, uh, you know, to decide as to what people should wear and what people should not wear? I mean, who is going to decide that? Is the state going to decide that? I don't think state has any right. State does not have any right. <coughs> Be, <coughs> yes, you can say in an institution that there is a uniform. No problem. But for example, Article 25, you know, which guarantees uh, freedom of religion and freedom of conscience expressly uh, recognizes the right of Sikhs to carry kirpans. Now, why was it done? Because our constitutional framers felt that these are some of the things which are untouchable. We don't want, you know, uh, we don't want <clears throat> people's religious beliefs to be really discussed in public life. These are all issues which, to my mind, it's really nonsensical for the state to really bring this. Uh, I, <coughs> I genuinely feel that Article 19.1a stands violated. Article 14, which guarantees equality, stands violated. And most of all, I feel that the state, by encouraging <coughs> certain elements to create law and order problem, has committed gross, I would say, uh, gross uh, improprieties amounting to virtual failure of the constitutional machinery in the state. And I feel that the BJP government is squarely responsible for what it has done. And I will read out to you the judgment of the Supreme Court in S.R. Bomai's case, where a constitution bench of nine justices upheld secularism. And this is what the uh, Supreme Court had to say. It says that Article 25 prohibits government to patronize a particular religion as state religion overtly or covertly. Political party is therefore positively enjoined to maintain neutrality in religious beliefs and prohibit practices derogatory to the constitution and the laws. <clears throat> Introduction of <coughs> religion into politics is not merely a negation of constitutional mandate, but a positive violation of constitutional obligation, <laughs> duty, responsibility, and positive prescription of prohibition specifically enjoyed by constitution. The political party that seeks to secure power through religious policy and caste orientation policy disintegrates people on the ground of religion. It divides people, disrupts social structure on grounds of religion and caste, which is obnoxious and anathema to the constitutional culture and basic features. Now, this is what the <coughs> warning <coughs> of Supreme Court was. Now, therefore, to my mind, Karnataka government Firstly, allowing this you know, pro uh, problem to crop up, it is an engineered problem. It is definitely engineered at the political level. And then government for the government to issue orders under Section 13 of the Education Act to supposedly justify yes. it is, I think, putting <coughs> <coughs> fuel to the fire. So <clears throat> I definitely feel that there is a gross failure on the part of the Karnataka government in ensuring constitutional uh, uh, morality, constitutional ethos, constitutional principle, and constitutional guarantees. I'll give you a minute, Mr. Ravi, to sip something warm because I know that uh, Delhi's weather and Delhi's pollution is really bad for, uh, for the citizens who live in that city, unfortunately. And I'll read out for the audience what the Karnataka government did this week. It enforced um, or invoked Section 133 of the Karnataka Education Act of 1983 to state the students have to wear whatever dress or outfit is chosen by the College Development Committee or the Appellate Committee. And it said that it is not going to permit any piece of clothing that is that can affect the law and order situation, basically cause unease. Um, and here's the thing, right? So it has now spiraled out of control. And what we saw today, which was personally very, uh, very disturbing, was one young woman who rode in on her two-wheeler wearing a full burqa, who was heckled by about 30 young men wearing saffron shawls. Now, uh, the, uh, the saffron gumcha or the saffron scarf, their argument is, if she's allowed to wear the burqa, I can wear my religion as well. Um, the question here, 
um, you know, and, and there are various legal arguments that have been made as well. Um, you know, there are some articles that have quoted uh, Asha Ranjit versus State of Bihar saying that one person's individual rights cannot be used to put the entire community in danger. Is that what is happening here? Can it be argued that a young woman of 16 or 17 covering her head in, in a classroom is a law and order situation? Mr. Dhami? I, 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 I think, uh, you know, uh, the entire controversy is, I think, uh, you know, generated politically. There is no doubt about it. Otherwise, there was complete peace. And mind you, let me, <coughs> let me again <coughs> uh, tell you about state of Karnataka. Yes. In 2004, 2004, in a case relating to Karnataka state against Praveen Togadia, then, you know, head of the Vishwa Hindu Parishad, the Supreme Court had made this damning warning about Karnataka. It said, therefore, from the point of view of the state, religion, faith or belief of a particular person has no place <coughs> and given no scope for imposition on individual citizen. Unfortunately, of late, vested interests fanning religious fundamentalism of all kinds, vying with each other, are attempting to subject constitutional machineries of the state to great stress and strain with certain quaint ideas of religious priorities to promote their own selfish ends, undeterred and unmindful of the disharmony it may ultimately bring about and even undermine national integration achieved with much difficulties and laudable determination of those strong-spirited servants of yesteryears. Now, this is the warning against Karnataka by the Supreme Court in 2004. Unfortunately, <coughs> we are seeing today UP elections have become extraordinarily important for the Bharatiya Janta Party. It knows that if it loses UP, then it's likely to lose 2024 elections. And, <coughs> and, the, and the feeling which is coming, emerging from UP today, is the tide is tilted against the BJP. There is no other reason why these kind of developments must take place in BJP ruled states. Karnataka is a laboratory for UP. These, these video, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, <coughs> these footages of what is happening in Karnataka for last 72 hours are footages actually meant for the crowds in Uttar Pradesh. I have no doubt that social media in Uttar Pradesh is circulating them across the state with vengeance. And because they know they cannot do that in the election bound state, they are doing it here because unfortunately, I mean, if the Britishers had anybody who really follows them to the hilt, it's the Bharatiya Janata Party, divide and rule. And it's an extremely sad commentary because otherwise it's a very good party. It has good leaders. But unfortunately, under the leadership of Mr. Uh, Modi <coughs> and Mr. Amit Shah, BJP is perhaps losing its focus. And this, uh, you know, this kind of an attempt with over 150 million Muslims, what are we going to achieve? We will never have peace in this country if there is no unity, if there is no fraternity, if there is no brotherhood of men and women. There can never be peace in this country. As Edmund Burke had said long back, you can rule by force for some time, but you can't rule by force all the time. And if you have to rule by force, then you are not governing at all. Now, this is what, I mean, why should common men suffer in Karnataka? Because somebody suddenly decides that I should not allow the girls, young girls wearing hijab to come to the school. I mean, it's really sad that the political party in power is, uh, you know, allowing this situation to be created. And I, I feel that uh, I hope and pray that the court comes down heavily and court has made an appeal to people rightly so to maintain peace because I have no doubt that the learned judge who's hearing it is also extremely disturbed by what is happening. We all are. We don't want innocent lives to be lost. We don't want innocent people to suffer. Ultimately, who are the sufferers? The common man, not those who are rich and powerful. So, I mean, it's something which we really have to introspect and ponder as a nation. 
Well, a couple of things that, that have uh, come up and uh, some of the journalists who are on the ground have reported that there are um, larger parties, political parties that are distributing the saffron gumchas, the, uh, you know, the turbans, the whatever these children are wearing. Uh, one of the videos that circulated where after they did their little protest and display of, uh, of uh, angst, they all took it out and gave it to that person. And that person was speaking in Hindi, which I can tell you, in Dakshina Karnataka is not normal. Uh, that accent is not normal. So obviously there is there, there are political parties at play here um, as well. But there's a, there's one point that has come up repeatedly. There's several journalists have also argued this. Vishnu is arguing it on our uh, you know on our uh, list is on our chat window as well. He says France doesn't allow the hijab. How about we move towards a little bit of progress? Uh, and this brings us back to a conversation you and I have had in the past, Mr. Kapi, the idea of secularism and our interpretation of what secularism is in India. Let me be very clear about the fact that we have a chief minister in this country who dresses exclusively in suffered all the time. He wears his religion. We have a prime minister who on a regular basis, as little as less than 48 hours ago, was dressed for a religious event. Um, on a regular basis, we have, you know, we all wear our religion, um, you know, when we step out of the house, as opposed to say, France, where the interpretation is different, and they do not encourage their citizens to wear their religion in public spaces. Would you be able to explain to our audience the difference between these two interpretations of secularism? Look, uh, I think uh, you must realize that India has a history of 5000 years. France is too young a nation to really have the kind of uh, uh, religious uh, ethos, religious multipl uh, multi uh, multiplicity, uh, religious uh, you know, development as India has had. And over these 5,000 years, India's uh, religions, India's religious traditions have all been maintained very beautifully, very peacefully. And each community <coughs> has respected <coughs> the other communities, when it comes to their religious beliefs, their religious uh, way of life, their cultural ways of life, uh, everything has always been respected for all these thousands of years. So, I mean, you may be right that France did not allow, but Austria's constitution court has said hijab is constitutional. That's Austria, which is next door to France. Yes. I mean, uh, and there are many, uh, you know, institutions, uh, I mean, bodies like the uh, Football Federation, uh, FIFA, that has allowed hijab, for example. So I, I, these are all, you know, we have to understand in the context of India, we have the second largest population of Muslims in the country. And we must respect nobody. You see, ultimately, what is, what is, uh, uh, what, what is, what is dress important to an individual? I think it represents, uh, 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 it represents its uh, individual's culture visibly. And there's nothing wrong about it. Nothing wrong about it. Why is it that uh, people in Maharashtra wear those lovely topis, white topis? That's part of their culture. Why is it that in Gujarat they wear Gandhi topis? That's part of their culture. Why is it that in Himachal they wear special Himachali topis, which Prime Minister was uh, donning on uh, you know, uh, the Republic Day Parade? Yes. Because that's their culture. So we cannot you know, forget that this country has amazing diversity in cultures and that cultures uh, diversity in cultures including diversity in dressing so there's nothing wrong about people dressing the way they want to so long as it is not it is i mean so long as it's a sober dressing and it is not uh, you know uh, it's not uh, ugly uh, it, there is nothing wrong about it so I, I think uh, uh, this controversy about dressing should really never take place in this country. People must be allowed to dress the way they were. I've seen judges, for example, in the Supreme Court in last 30 years who, who, uh, who have uh, lots of tilak on their foreheads coming from uh, uh, Tamil Nadu. They are deeply religious. I have known of a judge who would never wear uh, you know, shoes on the dais when he was sitting on the dais. He would take it out and sit. That's his religious belief. There's nothing wrong. See, there are million kinds of beliefs that people have culturally and religious, uh, religion-wise, which we all must respect. 
so i i don't think uh, you know this this controversy is nothing but an attempt to divide and rule and the bhartiya janata party has so far succeeded in unfortunately you know uh, persuading large number of people amongst the majority that minority are a threat and uh, 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 they are trying to project that the minorities uh, uh, want to assert their uh, individuality their status because they want to ultimately dominate now yes. you know the census figures tell us that the increase in population of the minority is marginally higher than the increase in population amongst the majority and yet it is been you know flagged and flogged again and again by right wingers that no no muslims are growing at some unusual place and that they are going to have uh, you know overtake this country some day so i mean all this is really not good we we you know as i have said earlier also we are a nation with unique problems we are a nation with unique challenges and yet we are a nation with great opportunities what are we going to do with 130 crore people if you are going to waste our time in this kind of nonsensical debates yes. we need to talk about education we need to talk about health we need to talk about mal um, uh, undernourishment we need to talk about poverty we need to talk about development we need to talk about securing the country we have a greatest threat so now all so that nobody wants to have that conversation because look at the data look at the data of the fact that we have shoved more people back into poverty over the last decade than ever before look at the fact that malnourishment numbers have got in worse we have the largest population of children who sleep hungry in this country than anywhere else in the world we have the largest population of children whose height and weight does not match than anywhere else in the world we have women who have gone out of work in the last 5 years fewer women participating in the workforce we have uh, <laughs> all of all of the things that you called out i can give you data to show that we have done worse as unemployment numbers have gotten worse poverty numbers have gotten worse hunger has gotten worse education we have failed let's be honest as a country we have, over the we last year we have done very well in one area generating hatred amongst each other and growing our billionaires is the area that we have done really well at well, i must I mean, tell you i must tell you one thing that the supreme court again nine judges bench in puttu swami's case right to privacy yes. justice yes. chandra who speaking for the court very beautifully said that the way an individual citizen dresses or eats is matter of no concern to the state today you are killing in the name of beef to tomorrow you might start killing in the name of hijab what is what is it i mean is this what it, this great country uh, is meant for is it <coughs> <laughs> almost almost uh, uh, 100 years of independent struggle right from 1857 to 1947 90 years millions of people have laced, sacrificed their lives to give us the freedom it's not to be squandered away for these kind of you know irrelevant yes. issues so i think uh, people must realize now that politicians are really interested in perpetuating their power at any cost even at the cost of pitting people against them each other people must therefore now become more intelligent they must see through this game and must reject this kind of you know behavior of the politicians whichever party it may be whether it is bjp or congress or any party which wants to divide us we people must understand and must reject them for all times to come well, there is a question that keeps popping up and so i'm going to ask this question i sort of know what your answer is going to be already which is in school though when wearing a uniform there should be no religious um, you know articles shown at all whether it is christian hindu muslim nobody should be allowed to wear anything on top of the uniform is what a lot of our audience members are arguing at this point saying they can do it at home but not in school now my fundamental problem here is which sort of lends to your argument of this being cooked up is that these students these these young women were standing outside the school holding up their admission prospectus which said very clearly that they could wear a head scarf provided it matched their uniform all of a sudden multiple schools across karnataka have suddenly decided they're not going to allow these students in the um, ag in karnataka the lawyer that represents the state government argued in court today that the state government has not intervened in any way so where has this come from and okay. do you agree that government schools 
uh, need to have a really strict uniform listen uh, even if, even if you have a strict uniform are the sikhs allowed to wear turbans are you going to tell sikh community that please stop even in england or in canada where sikhs are there in the majority even in us army the sikh has a one a case where he was asked not to wear a turban and the <coughs> ultimately they held that no he is entitled because this is part of his religious belief now i would not even go to the extent of saying that whether this is religious belief or not ultimately if you know young girls want to cover their face with hijab i mean their choice must be respected as citizens as free citizens as part of overall freedom that individual has i can understand if somebody wants to take off his dress the state public uh, you know decency comes in and public order comes in but where somebody wants to you know cover oneself little more extra i think state should come and say that no don't cover yourself extra i think that that's ridiculous uh, shashwat kumar says if you are allowing burqa then you should be uh, you should allow the saffron gamcha or the saffron shawl as well no if they want to wear up till now nobody brought uh, saffron gamchas and all that but i think if bjp thinks that they should give identity to their young children by giving them saffron scarves and let them do it no problem i i feel that uh, everybody has a right to do whatever they want to do so long as it's not <coughs> it's not indecent or done for the purpose of dividing the society if it is if people wear i mean uh, you know i have no doubt that in uh, smaller towns a lot of people, lot of young students must be wearing you know a uh, uh, headgear of some kind or some special dresses uh, take for example northeast their dressing is completely different in northeast they dress so differently a uh, traditional dresses and i have no doubt that lot of children go still go wearing uh, you know uh, traditional dresses to their schools so i mean these are all issues uh, which are irrelevant to my mind constitution permits freedom and freedom in widest sense of the term and that freedom cannot be curtailed by the state by imposing any kind of restrictions uh, so long as you know it is not intended uh, to in fact uh, a wearing of hijabs and burkhas is uh, is, is almost 1000 years old in this country since mm. islam came in so i mean those and there are, i i know <coughs> <clears throat> i know so many muslim families where they don't wear burqa and hijabs at all so it's a matter of choice and i still know e- even in cities where uh, you know uh, people you go to their homes and you find that their daughter in laws when they come out uh, with a cup of coffee or tea for you they will cover their head and come even in cities forget <coughs> villages gungat is is part of our culture gungat is part Mr. of Ravi, a lot of a lot of people on twitter very senior journalists on twitter have argued that since the that the, that the hijab is actually a instrument of oppression on young women and girls because men don't have to wear it they have to wear it they have to cover up and so it should not be encouraged and it certainly should not be encouraged in school um here the argument comes i ask i ask i ask all those senior journalists to go back to the villages and tell every daughter in law that you please do not uh, pull gungat on your faces and tell all mother in laws and father in laws that don't insist that your daughter in laws must you know cover their faces by gungats will they do it hmm. the answer is no so I, i what's this hypocrisy why are they picking on a particular community or particular individuals is their choice what is the operation about it is that not a operation you are talking about uh, uh, as against uh, 150 million people you are talking about almost uh, uh, you know 120 crore 25 crore people of this country where women still continue to you know uh, hide their faces in villages or even in cities before their elders or before strangers we don't want to discuss that we don't want to it's not a good practice to my mind it's not a good practice at all but yes it is culturally uh, existing we must respect it so i i don't understand this 
uh, you know, people who really want to uh, think that the women are being oppressed. I mean, let them be. I mean, if they want to maintain their cultural uh, individuality, their, <coughs> their religious individuality, they are entitled to. That's what Article 25 is about, that everyone has a right to, you know, have their own religion, religious beliefs and their own, <coughs> you know, right to conscience. In fact, BJP itself in both, uh, particularly in 2014 election manifesto, I distinctly remember, had promised that we will allow the minority community to protect its culture and we will make sure that their culture is protected. It's expressly provided in the BJP manifesto. Please check that up. So uh, have they forgotten that? What did they mean by that? Mr. Dave, also in our constitution, um, most of our fundamental rights come with a, with a certain list of exceptions. They're not absolute. One of those exceptions is public order. Uh, Mr. Kamath in court reading out a judgment said the right to practice religion as a fundamental right is subject to public order. Uh, could that argument actually hold any water in this case, in your opinion? Public order will come into uh, play if provided there is likelihood of any uh, danger to law and order situation. Public order doesn't mean public order in some abstract. I mean, wearing of a hijab for last thousand years is not a, you know, is not a, a, a provocation for <coughs> violence. <coughs> public order <coughs> must be understood in a different sense. You, you look at Madhu Lima's judgment, where Supreme Court has very beautifully analyzed public order. You don't, you know, you don't restrict the meaning of public order uh, to really, uh, you know, put a kind of uh, uh, limitations on people's uh, freedoms. No, public order comes into play only when individuals' freedom, of course, it is subservient to common good. It is subservient to societal interests. But if the individual's freedom is not going to hurt societal interests, which in this case, it doesn't. See, I personally may not agree with wearing of hijabs and burkhas, certainly. But that doesn't mean I, I should impose my will on somebody else. So it's, it's, and it's not something in which, which, you know, creates a revulsion in me that mm -hmm. I should, you know, that I should feel that public order is likely to be affected and violence will erupt. Violence will certainly erupt. It, <coughs> in political parties. Could it be, could be argued, Mr. Dave, that today, the, what we saw play out today, stones thrown at a school, girls heckled, uh, you know, boys showing up in saffron gumchas. Uh, there was a showdown in a couple of places. The, the state has closed schools for everybody. See, that is a failure. That's what I began by saying that that's a failure of the uh, state's uh, con uh, government. It's a failure of the constitutional machinery on the part of the state. It's a complete breakdown of the constitutional machinery to my mind. If this had happened in a Congress ruled state or opposition ruled state, BJP would have been asking for dismissal of the government. And their governor, uh, you know, <coughs> like in <coughs> West Bengal or Maharashtra or Kerala or Tamil Nadu would have been overactive in sending reports to Sri Amit Shah asking for certain action, interference by the central government. Oh, come on now. I, I, I feel that, I mean, it's a matter of really serious concern for us, those of us who love constitution, who love rule of law that this kind of it's self engineered you know uh, self goals being scored by party in power is not good for this country's democracy it's not good for democratic system it's really bad and i think bjp government must own up the responsibility and straighten things up tomorrow and within <laughs> not you know delay any further otherwise this kind of a uh, this kind of a i would say poison which is being spread will spread in other states, as you said, in Madhya Pradesh, they want to bring the law. I mean, where will we end with all this? You brought, two years ago, you brought these love jihad laws. What has happened? In most cases, the other day, I saw in Gujarat that a girl has filed a complaint against her own father. The father filed a complaint against the girl's Muslim husband. The girl has filed a FIR against her father, saying that he is the one who is responsible for all these nonsense. Are we going to create this kind of problem in society? Are we going to ruin families? Are we going to really kill love in society? We can't do that. 
I have I have one more question for you because of what played out today in some of these colleges. In the government junior PU college in Kundapur, remember these were the girls who were sitting outside for several hours waiting to be let in over the last couple of days. They were allowed inside of campus. They were seated in a separate classroom. They were not allowed inside their own classroom. And they were told that if they want to attend class, they will have to take the hijab off, which they refused to do. So they were just seated in an empty classroom with no classes at all, all day. That is college number one. College number two, which is the Vardara <coughs> Government First Grade College in Kundapur. Students in hijab were just sent home. The uh, vice principal of the college said, we told them if you want to attend classes, you have to take out the hijab. They refused, so we asked them to leave. We're just waiting for the high court order. Here, is this a violation of their right to equality, their right to education, and the fact that their matter is subject is before the high court? Can these colleges use it as an excuse not to provide these girls with an education? Well, certainly they can't. I mean, it would be uh, not only unconstitutional uh, and, uh, you know, ex facie illegal, but it would be the perhaps the worst kind of a moment in the life of this beautiful country where the government is unable to not only ensure the safety and well-being of these students, but is preventing them from getting the education, which is their right. Right to education is a fundamental right. It's part of right to life. And if the government you know, fails in ensuring that right in you know, its true sense, then it's government's failure. To my mind, it's an ab absolute abject failure on the part of the government. See, look at it this way. <clears throat> We have a lot of relations <coughs> with many Middle Eastern countries now. Prime Minister Mr. Modi is on personal, you know, name calling basis with many leaders, including Prince Mohammed of Saudi Arabia. Now, if all these leaders of the Middle East come in a delegation and have, you know, women accompanying them wearing uh, hijabs and burkhas, is the government of India going to say we will not deal with them? We will not talk to them. We will not invite such delegations and welcome them. Where are we going to end? I mean, we are becoming a <clears throat> laughing stock in front of the world. In front of, see, the problem is that Indian media has disastrously failed. You, if you want to see what people think about us, go to France television, go to DW, <coughs> go to BBC, go to CNN, go to Al Jazeera. You know what the mirror about India is. It's really, it hurts. It hurts me because I love my country so much. I, I know that there is great potential in this country. We can be, you know, second to none in the world. But we are not interested. We are ourselves interested in pulling us down by this kind of completely medieval issues. Mm. Completely medieval issues. We don't need to do that. My final question to you is this, Mr. Dave. You did say that this is all political in order to reflect on the elections that are taking place in the state of Uttar Pradesh. In that case, are the high courts and the Supreme Court our only option here? How do we guard ourselves from political parties that will create issues like this simply to win elections? I think uh, most important you know, uh, uh, need of the hour today is awareness amongst people, consciousness amongst people as to what really a state should be, what really secularism is, what really rule of law is, what really are constitutional you know, principles, what really are fundamental freedoms. So, you know, un unless and until people are conscious of that, people become aware of that, people will not be able to respect that in a right spirit. And people, we are trying to push people into thinking in small things. We must allow people to think liberally as broadly as possible so that we can all respect each other in, you know, within those, uh, you know, uh, uh, in that broad parameters, respect everything about others. So I, I, I feel that, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, we can't just leave it to the judiciary. I, I don't think judiciary is uh, so strong in this country today that it can really tie over these kind of challenges, which is being now. Uh, generated uh, by us, uh, uh, you know, within the country. No, we people need to fight it back. And I have no doubt that people will ultimately, you know, uh, push back this kind of, uh, uh, you know, this kind of a backlash, this kind of, uh, 
uh, short-sighted approaches of political parties, people will overcome that with passage of time. I really hope so, Mr. Davi, and I thank you for your time. As always, I hope that your throat is better soon. <laughs> You'll start to feel better soon as well. Okay. Um, as far as I'm concerned, just to remind you <laughs> how I feel uh, about what's going on in our country, I think that whatever your politics is and whatever your emotions or your opinion may be, leave the women alone. Leave the girls alone. Getting an education is paramount to the foundation of women and young girls finding their voice, finding their feet, and becoming fully functioning members of society. Preventing young girls from getting an education is the worst, most immoral, terrible thing anybody can do, irrespective of whatever your reasons are. To have young girls stand at the gate of a college and beg to be let in is the worst thing we have seen happen in this country. There is no excuse. It doesn't matter how they showed up. You give them that education because that is their future. The women are the future. We can have no argument. And it doesn't matter what you think they should wear because nobody cares what you think they should wear. At the end of the day, the only person who should decide what a woman should wear is that woman. Maybe she's comfortable shrouding herself from head to toe because she doesn't like the way men in this country look at her. Maybe she's comfortable wearing just a t-shirt. Maybe she's comfortable wearing a bikini. Unfortunately, it doesn't matter what she decides to wear, the men in this country will always have opinions about it. And invariably, in many cases, also have action that they take. Women have to battle that action on a daily basis when they go to college, when they go to school, when they go to work. Not only have you taken away public spaces, not only have you taken away safety, not only have you taken away all forms of equality from women who want to work alongside and achieve their full potential, you're stopping them from going to school. There is nothing worse than a man with a baseless opinion on what a woman is wearing, stopping her from getting an education. The quicker we realize this as a country, the better it will be for all of us. Women are the future. Get out of the way. For the I, governments. I fully endorse that. For the senior journalists and the men who are giving us your opinion, nobody cares what you think. Get There's out of the way. One more last thing I would like to say that there is a conscious effort on the part of uh, government to uh, discourage uh, young Muslim boys and girls from going to madrasas and turning towards formal education system. By these kind of methods, we are pushing them back into madrasas. And, you know, it's not good for us. It's not good. We want them to get benefit of the modern education and, you know, have liberal thoughts, liberal ideas and become part and parcel of the mainstream of the society. We can't stop that. So that's a real challenge. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mr. Davi. Thank you. I want to thank our audience for joining us. Uh, we will continue to keep an eye on this because it is, like I said, a terrible thing that's happening and it's likely to spread into other states as well. So we'll bring you the updates on what's happening in the Karnataka High Court as well. Thank you for watching. Good night. Right.